Hi, New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> so everybody, thanks so much for coming back after the break. And we have a very special treat for you with the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia. Sister Krista Marie is going to be our guide for today, but they'll be, you'll be seeing other sisters as well. And I, I'm just so excited for all of you to see this. Um, uh, just a reminder, we are looking at chats. We're looking at all uh, everything. So um, Sister Krista, just take it away and we can't wait to see what you have in store for us. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to sunny Nashville. <laughs> we are the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia of Nashville, Tennessee, and we are so honored that you have come to spend a little bit of time with us today to see where we live and to hear a little bit about our life. So I'd like to introduce, for those of you that just arrived, Sister Anna Joy, standing next to Jesus, right in front of our house. So this is our mother house, our convent. This is where all of our sisters come home to. And it was built, interestingly, during the Civil War. So our order was founded in 1860. And the convent, for you history buffs, is the only building in Nashville, major building project that was completed during the Civil War. So we look at it as a great grace from the Lord. So the, the building that is right in front of you is the original structure to the right right to the right um and then it, it was built in segments from there on i'd like to just show you real quick the outside of the chapel as well it was not built until 2005 and that will be the first place we go inside but i just wanted you to get to see the outside it is our most um important prized precious part of our house so let's walk in and get our tour our sisters teach in nashville but we also teach in nearly 40 other places in the country and around the world including canada australia ireland scotland rome and the netherlands and our sisters come from all over the united states and the world. The sisters, we, you can enter as early as after high school. There was a sister in my group that entered right after high school and she just made final vows last year. And it's, it's amazing. The sisters are primarily all teachers after they enter. That's our main apostolate is teaching. So we are gonna go right inside to the chapel. Hi everybody, <laughs> it's good to see you. I'm Sister Krista Marie. I just wanted to say our chapel is dedicated to St. Cecilia, the Roman Virgin Martyr. Cecilia was Christian in Rome when it was illegal to be Christian. And ultimately she gave her life as a witness for the faith. So we call her a martyr, a witness. And she was this bold woman who was not afraid to speak the truth. And we all pray every day for her intercession and to be more like her. But we chose her as our patroness, primarily once St. Dominic loved her, and she's the patron of music and the arts, and we were founded as a boarding school for girls in 1860. So right now, we're gonna start with a, a chapel visit, is what we call it. We pop into the chapel before we leave the house and when we come home and after dinner to make visits to the Lord in the chapel because we recognize that all energy for the apostolate, all energy to love comes from Jesus' true presence in the Eucharist. So we go to see him as often as we can during the day. So we're going to give you a chance to just begin our time together with a couple of moments silence with him. So you're making this chapel visit with us and we're going to be praying for you. So we're going to do a little bit of the chapel tour in silence. And then we're going to end with prayers. Okay.
No. While the music plays, Cecilia sang in her heart. To her God, though the darkness raged, Cecilia prayed, make my heart immaculate that I may not be confounded, Lord, that I not fear, that I may not fear even the sword, with conscience pure, with conscience pure, and faith sincere, I wait with joy, I wait with joy for my bridegroom, is In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we just come before you, and we love you, and we offer you all of the intentions of all of the women with us today. We ask that you bless them, bless their families. Help them to know that you are a protector and provider and that you love them more than anything. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Cecilia, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So as we leave the chapel, I just thought I would tell you a little bit about our founder, St. Dominic we're Dominicans named after St. Dominic. So we are followers of him. He was a contemporary with St. Francis of Assisi, and he saw the need for religious to leave their monasteries and to teach and preach the good news of the gospel. There was a lot of heresy and confusion and lies being spread at the time of St. Dominic. And so he saw the value of teaching the laity, the truth, and how to follow truth himself, which is Jesus Christ. So we, as his followers, are teachers and preachers of the gospel. I just wanted to um, 
a very Dominican tradition, is to sing the Salve every night at the end of night prayer or Compline. As you saw the chapel stalls in the chapel, the sisters pray choir to choir. So we use our whole body to pray. And at the end of each evening, we end the day and give it to the under the protection of Our Lady. So we sing the Salve together and everyone is blessed with holy water. And this came from a vision that St. Dominic had um, at a time when the brothers were really being tested. And he saw this vision of Our Lady in the chapel during the Salve. And um, halfway through the Salve, she knelt down, prostrated herself before the tabernacle, praying for the brothers. So we have this deep devotion to Our Lady and specifically to the Salve, which we also pray for the dying. And when any of our sisters are close to death, we pray the Salve at their bedside. So St. Dominic has a lot of treasured memories and stories. Uh, we could go on forever with all of them, but maybe we'll just tell you one more. And that as St. Dominic, uh, he was blessed to see and be and to see a lot of different visions or uh, witness miracles happen in his lifetime. And one of these visions or dreams that he had was one night he was, he dreamt of heaven and his heart was on fire with love for the Lord as he was in his presence. And and when he saw and he's looking around at all the saints in heaven and they're rejoicing in the Lord. But then he started to weep and our Lord turned to St. Dominic and said, my son, why are you crying? And St. Dominic said, oh, dear Lord, it is good to be here, but I do not see any of the, the religious that you told me to found in heaven with you. And he said, oh, my son, I have entrusted them to our lady. And so he gestures over to the Blessed Mother, and as she opens her mantle, all of the Dominicans are huddled underneath her mantle. And so we, we rejoice in her, in her patronage of Our Lady Queen of Preachers, and we desire to, um, to be under Our Lady's mantle. So like Sister Christa Marie said, that beautiful tradition of singing the song every night, we just nestle close to Our Lady and entrust ourselves and our actions to her intercession. All right, we'll show you maybe one of our partners. So I mentioned this school was founded as a boarding school in 1860. So we still have all of the original buildings, but our, they're used for different things now because our boarding school was moved off campus in 1957. St. Cecilia Academy is still going strong. But so this room is now a parlor, but it was a classroom when, this, when the boarding school was here. So you can imagine 150 years ago, the sisters in here with all of their students teaching. Um, there's a fireplace in every room because it would get cold in the winter. So we're gonna stop here. <laughs> have a visit with you. <laughs> <laughs> so we were sent some of your questions ahead of time. So we're gonna take a minute now and try to answer some of them. Some of you are so thoughtful to send them directly to us. Um, so I'm going to ask Sister Anna Joy some, and she's going to ask some. Sister Anna Joy, did you always want to be a sister? Actually, yes. I always wanted to be a sister. I first desired to be a religious sister when I was in first grade, and um, it was the only time I ever had a sister as a teacher, and um, there was just something so attractive about it that at that point, I thought I was also to be a mom at the same time and singer and all those other things. So granted, as I grew up, I realized some of the things that weren't as, um, the, what really captured my heart was religious life. And so that was the thing that stuck me most. So yeah, I always did want to be a sister. I had wanted to be a sister when I was little, but then I went through a long, long time of where I really just thought I was going to get married. Like I went to high school, I went to college, like normal. And the Lord made it very clear that this was his call for me. Because honestly, if I would have, if I would have tried to figure it out myself, I probably would have gotten married and had a lot of kids. Because that's natural and that's beautiful. Marriage and family is so beautiful. 
And there's something about being a, a mother, a spiritual mother, that makes you a better religious. So I heard it said, if you wouldn't make a good mom, you probably wouldn't make a very good religious. So I'm grateful for my family and the discernment that I had. And I'm so, so grateful <laughs> to be here. Okay. Okay, let me ask you a question. All right. So what is it like teaching as a sister? Because sister, you taught before you entered. So what was the difference between teaching as a sister and teaching a not? So what was the difference for you? The difference in teaching as a sister, at least from my short experience, has been that seeing each one of my students as a precious child of God, knowing that they have an immortal soul that is going to live forever, my priorities are a tiny bit different. Like I do everything I'm supposed to do. You check off the curriculum, you teach it the best you can, but you love in a deeper way. The, the whole, you see the whole child, the whole person as this precious gift from God that he loves so much. And if every day, if I'm able to just communicate a little bit of that love and the truth of God to that child, it's been a blessed day. So it is, it is different. I loved teaching before and after being a sister, but my perspective is different now that I'm a sister. Okay. Did you <laughs> find it hard to leave your family? Um, yes, that that's probably one of the hardest things, leaving family, because um, I love my family, and uh, we all love our families. That's natural. That's good. But yes, it, it is it is a hard, it is a sacrifice, but there's also um, such a hundredfold in being part of another family. I'm part of the Dominican family. I'm part of our family at St. Cecilia Dominicans. I get to meet all of their families and you feel this very, um, very tangible and very real um, relationship with, with um, the different sisters and their family members that come in the other house. So while it is a sacrifice and I do, miss my family um, I still I have received an even larger family and they have received a, an even larger family mm -hmm. yeah. my mom likes to joke that she loves saying that she not only she didn't lose a daughter she's gained 300 so but they they come and visit us regularly that's what these parlors are used for nowadays and um, and we get to visit them so it, it really it's really a nice arrangement in fact I, we joke, they say, they probably see me more as a religious sister than if I was having, if I was unmarried, if I have kids or I was traveling around. So actually being a sister, everybody comes and visit me. So they, they make time in their schedule to come and be with one another. So it's really been a gift to bring our family together at a time when my siblings are getting married and having kids and starting having families. So it's, it's been a real blessing. So are your days all the same? What's a day like for a oh, sister? That's a good point. Okay. So a typical day in the life, so our life is structured around a prayer. Um, so Dominic, he founded this religious community at a time when really religious were just in their monasteries. And even though he saw the need to be an active, uh, be an apostle and preaching the gospel, there's also a big value in that monastic life. So we are contemplative apostles. So we have both active life and teaching, and we have the contemplative life with our monastic customs. So being monastic means that we, we live together in community. There's a big emphasis on that community because it's, it's our spiritual family. Um, so we start our day with prayer in the chapel so that we're nourished by the word of the Lord. Uh, there's this Dominican phrase to contemplate and to give to others the fruits of our contemplation. We cannot give what we first have, have not received. Um, we love because he first loved us, First John, you know? So we cannot give and preach if we have not first received from who is the preacher, the teacher. Mm -hmm. So uh, we start and root our day in prayer together. And to be like Sister Christmary said, we're, uh, we pray with our full body. So we pray choir to choir. So not only are we preaching to our students or whoever we're around, but we preach to each other during the divine office, which is the prayer of the church. Um, and so we sing and we receive from one another. So our full bodies with our, our profound vows, and, and we're singing, and I'm a musician, so I think 
that the singing aspect as well is a beautiful instrument. <laughs> On words. It's a beautiful instrument that really allows us to enter more deeply into the prayer of the church because as you're singing these ancient psalms that have been prayed from the beginning, from Jewish tradition onward through Catholic tradition, um, they really become a part of you and you have these kind of on your heart and your mind throughout the day. So once we've received that prayer and that strength in, in the sacrifice of the Mass and our prayer, uh, we eat together in community. So we have a dining room that we call the refectory, and uh, it's supposed to be an extension of the chapel. So we sit similarly in our refectory as we do in the chapel, facing choir to choir, and we eat in silence so that we can listen to a reading at table. This is a monastic custom. So that as we're being physically fed, again, we're being spiritually fed. And that could be either saint biography or just uh, some works from the different popes, um, um, a whole conglomeration of different great literature. We've had some really great readings um, and continually being formed. And so we're teachers. Um, and at the beginning um, of our religious life, we're, we may not be teaching, so we go to school and we are students. And then when we are teaching, we're in the school teaching. So I mean, we're just learning and, and, and growing together. So we spend our day at school, um, either teaching or being a student. And then we come back home to the mother house. We have our chapel visit, which you got to experience a little bit. Uh, but also we come back together in prayer. We enter into the prayer of the church. And it's this beautiful opportunity to reunite everything that's happened in that day back to the Lord. Give thanks for the good things. Um, give him our petitions um, and, and our intentions that we've received in that day. Um, and then we have this lovely time in the evening. We, we recreate together. We have some communal time, family time. So just to be with one another, to share different funny stories that happen because inevitably something's going to happen to someone. And just to, to give thanks um, and to, uh, to the Lord for his good things, but also to receive from one another. So it's that continual, like receiving from the Lord in the chapel and, and, and extending that love that we've received to others. And we receive it among ourselves as sisters. We receive it through our students, through the faculty, through whoever we encounter. But most importantly, we receive it first from the Lord. And then we end our day with that beautiful compliment. Um, it's our favorite hour of the day, the prayer of the church where we, um, we right before we close our eyes at night, we give everything back to the Lord. Um, we do that beautiful solving procession to Our Lady and sing a very ancient Dominican chant to our Father, St. Dominic. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely day. <laughs> Thank, you. Great. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah. Before I entered, this just came to me. I wondered about monastic orders, they live in a lot of silence. And I wondered what that would be like, if it would be too hard for me, because I like to talk, <laughs> so <to> sister. <laughs> and it's been a beautiful journey. It is challenging to live in silence, but at Cardinal Sarah has said in his book, I'm sure many of you have read The Power of Silence, silence is the first language of God. So in order to, pray, to learn how to pray more deeply and to enter into that silence, it really takes practice. So we're st we still continue to practice silence all our lives so that we're able to hear the Lord speak to us in the midst of our daily lives. Everybody needs silence in their lives to hear the Lord. Um, and the religious, and particularly our order, we've been given this great gift of silence in our day. So when there's adoration in the house at 4.30 in the afternoon, we go into silence. We don't talk anymore until after dinner. And then we have our recreation time, as Sister mentioned. But especially once we start teaching, you grow to appreciate the silence a lot more because we're with our students eight hours a day. <laughs> so you begin to yearn for that silence and for the time for prayer. It's a beautiful gift. Sister Anna Joy, what were you most surprised about when becoming a sister? Um, I think the biggest surprise is that our God is a God of surprises, and all these things that I thought I gave up to enter the religious life, um, things that I thought I would never do again, um, little things, I mean, it's like, oh, well, I won't be able to go to walk with my family, you know, like ridiculous things like that. Um, I actually like receive it in a hundredfold because 
so many things I didn't think I would be able to do. I had been able to play rugby and football and like all this other stuff. Um, and we're able to do it as religious, which I think is, is a gift to be able to give that to the Lord and then um, have no expectation so that when it does happen, it's just a complete gift. So I'm very grateful for that. What's been a surprise for you? I think one of the one of the greatest blessings, because it is a sacrifice to leave your family and to leave your friends. I mean, I'm still friends with a good number of people I was before, and it is hard. It's a sacrifice, but it makes it a worthy sacrifice to give to the Lord. If it wasn't hard, how much of a sacrifice is that then? You know, how much would it be worth? For me, it was worth a lot to give to the Lord and my family and my friends. And I think for a while I was like, am I, am I ever going to have like really good friends again? Like, am I going to have people that really know me and have people that really love me? Because I mean, I'm saying goodbye to all of them. Right. And you know what? Yes. <laughs> the Lord is so rich in his love for us that in some way my relationships with my family and friends have deepened since entering and the Lord has given me the gift of such great friendships that have just so enriched my life that I just don't know who I would even be without them. So it's been, that was, honestly, that was a great surprise after I entered. Oh, I have a question for you. <laughs> I remembered. <laughs> okay. What is it like living on mission as opposed to living at Mother House? So okay. mission being a convent outside of Okay, so our sisters, when we are not mission, when we don't live at the mother house, we live in one of our mission convents, possibly anywhere around the world. And it, but it is, we're so united in our common life, in our common prayer, and in the Eucharist that living on mission is an extension of our life at the mother house. We still enter into prayer at the same time, we're still living the daily orarium and the schedule together and we're still united in Christ in such a deep way but we go through our day it's not different like it's not if you're at the mother house and you're religious it's not different than if you're a religious on mission that um, relationship with Christ has got to be primary and loving your sisters and community and serving in the apostolate so the, the crux of it is is that it's not different you have a different home to go home to, but our life is still the same. One small thing that I really like, we have this really awesome bell here at the mother house. <laughs> and so every time we get together for, for prayer or for whatever we're doing, if we are, it's a monastic custom to be called by the bell. And so on mission, we don't have this big awesome bell, we have these like tiny teeny bells. And I just think <laughs> it's just so fun because every time you hear it, I just smile and, and, um, cause it, it, it's a little bit of home from the mother house because it reminds you of a big bell that calls us onward to heaven, onward um, to the Lord together. So it's a little thing, but it means a lot. Mm -hmm. We talked about this last question earlier. One of you asked, do you have a favorite part of your vocation? And I think the favorite part for everyone is being consecrated to the God of the universe and living for his honor and glory <laughs> My and <God>. for the <laughs> salvation of souls. <laughs> there's, um, there's so many other blessings and each one of us are blessed in a unique way because the Lord loves us in a very unique way. Each one of you, he loves in a very unique way. So he, he makes it very clear, his love for each individual one of us, which is also an awesome part of our vocation, but just being consecrated body and soul to the Lord Powerful. doesn't really get any yeah. better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for sending the questions in. We will answer some more later, I believe. But right now we're going to go to our, what's called a heritage room. It's sort of like our family album in a whole room because we had too many pictures to put in a book. But we're also going to meet a surprise friend there. Let's go meet her.
Our sisters teach in several different places in Nashville. We have where um, St. Cecilia was moved downtown. We've got the high school there. We also have Aquinas College, and we also have Overbrook, which is our elementary school right downtown Nashville. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to Sister Mary Laura. She <laughs> comes to us from Houston, Texas. <laughs> Shout out to Mrs. Rhonda Grunwald, I hear you there. So. <laughs> yes, okay, I'm coming closer. <laughs> Louder. Oh, can you hear me? Louder. Wow. <laughs> okay, so. This is, I'm so grateful to be with you today. Um, so I was asked to share my three minute vocation story, which I don't think I've done before. So come Holy Spirit. Um, so I guess I'm from Houston, Texas. And before I became a sister, I went to college at Ave Maria University in Florida and I was a music major. So I was, I graduated and I was working a bunch of different music jobs, part time music jobs before the Lord called me here. So let's see, I started, I first remember meeting Jesus and encountering his great love for me when I was just a little child. I was getting ready for my first Holy Communion and my family was so blessed to pray together ever since I was a little girl. And so I think that really helped to nurture and prepare me for my vocation in life. Uh, I remember one key moment that comes to mind is I was 11 years old and my parents invited a priest from our parish to come and consecrate our whole family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And my parents made it a really, a really beautiful celebration. Like after we did the consecration, we had a bunch of families over at our house and we all uh, celebrated this. And it was just really moved me knowing that my family belonged totally to Jesus. And I remember feeling that the Lord was calling me then to be a sister. And, uh, telling the priest about it. So that was really the, the first time that I felt Jesus calling me. Uh, and so he just continued to be so good and faithful to, to me and my family as I was growing up um, and becoming a teenager. And I he was and he was really drawing me to just come be with him more in adoration. So I have just beautiful memories of spending time with him in adoration at my church. And I remember getting close to graduation and I'm the oldest of five kids. And so I really felt the, the pressure of the world is like, what are you going to do with your life? And like, what's the plan? And I really didn't know. And so it was kind of a struggle to, uh, to think that I had to have it all planned out. But then I realized that God has a beautiful plan for my life. And just, he just was asking me to trust him. So I graduated high school uh, and went to college. And I thought for sure by the time I graduate college, right, I'm going to know what he wants me to do with my life. Uh, and he he's so good he just he gave me every step that I needed one step at a time you know I love music and I was thinking if I could have a theme song for my discernment I would probably choose uh, Leave Kindly Light by St. John Henry Newman so I love the part where he says uh, keep thou my feet I do not ask to see the distant scene one step enough for me so truly the Lord just gave me one step at a time as uh, in his loving providence. And so after I graduated, my mom, she said, there's this brand new Catholic high school that just opened up while I was away at college and they're looking for a pianist for their choir. And I think it would be a great job for you. So I applied and I got it. And the high school is Saudi Catholic high school run by our sisters. So that was the first time that I met our sisters. And one year later, the Lord called me to be a national Dominican. So praise the Lord. And I thought that <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, Brie Garen. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> wow. I, when I saw you and I heard your name, I was like, oh my gosh, mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
I thought it would be really beautiful. I, I really wanted to pray with you the prayer that my family still to this day prays every day to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It's our renewal prayer uh, for the consecration our family made back in like 2004 or something. And when we had that big celebration, all of the families that came to our house uh, prayed it with us. So I was hoping we'd be able to pray it together. I know that during this time of the pandemic, we're having a lot of quality time with our families. And so I just offer this as a prayer for you, all of your vocations, wherever you are in that journey, and for your family and every person in your family and their vocations. So let's just uh, entrust everything to our Lord's sacred heart and know that he loves us so much. Um, so please join me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, we renew our pledge of love and loyalty to you. Keep us always close to your loving heart and to the most pure heart of your mother. May we love one another more and more each day, forgiving each other's faults as you forgive our sins. Teach us to see you in those we meet outside our home. Please help us to carry our cross daily out of love for you, and help us to strengthen this love by frequent Mass and communion. Thank you, dear Jesus, King and friend of our family, for all the blessings of today. Protect all families in us, and help us all to get to heaven. Amen. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray, pray for us. Our guiding angel, pray for us. us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all so much. Say hi to Amy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> blessing, blessing and true surprise for me. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> God bless you, sister. God bless you, too. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, sister. Right now. <laughs> So we'd like to just spend the last couple minutes we have with you um, just describing our congregation and a little bit of our history. It's a rich American history. As I mentioned, we were founded during the Civil War, but our congregation actually began in Kentucky. There was a very bold priest who made an altar call and said, we need women. He was a Dominican priest. He said, we need women to teach the truth of Christ to our children. So he made this altar call and a handful of women actually came forward and said that they would dedicate their lives to Christ and in serving in the education. So if you fast forward to 1860, Four sisters were sent, actually were requested by the bishop to come to Nashville to start this school for girls, which is how St. Cecilia began. Now, a lot of orders began in Europe at this time. It was more rare to have an actual American con congregation. So we are very proud of our American heritage. And if you notice here on the wall, we have lots of different pictures. And our beautiful gift that we've had um, given to us and preserved through the grace of God has been our religious habit. It reminds us of who we are as consecrated brides of Christ, and it reminds us what we're about. Um, in a similar way that a wife would wear a wedding ring to remind herself that she is dedicated to her husband and her family. The sisters wear the religious habit of St. Dominic to remember who we are. And it, we love it dearly. So here are a couple of pictures of when St. Cecilia was a boarding school. Those pictures of the girls were boarders here. They were not sisters. And um, they all lived up on the third floor in what we call the dormitories, where if you come on a retreat here, that's where our retreatants get to stay when they come to visit. And the community has entered into really every moment in the history of the South. We've gone through periods where they needed extra help with nurses or running an orphanage or helping with um, yellow fever, cholera patients. And we've, we've been able to participate in those things, but we are primarily teachers. 
Right now you're getting a sneak peek into our cloister courtyard. Cloister is a special word that means a place that's set aside for the special use of the sisters. And we actually don't get to go into this courtyard for the first five years we're here. It's pretty special. So if any of you come and visit and see the heritage room, you'll be able to peek out into the courtyard. <laughs> We could spend hours in this room. So we're just gonna show a couple more pictures and have one more story. We're blessed to have our sisters when, when they pass to the Lord, we stay with them before um, the burial and we have our cemetery here so that we can visit them whenever we would like. It's a real gift. You can see a little bit of our refectory that I was talking about earlier in here. You see it's we're just facing choir to choir, eating together and then there's a picture of a sister reading at table. It's a series of pictures of the different additions as they were added onto the house over the years. And our final one being in 2005. I'd like to just take this moment to introduce you to one of our beloved sisters. She has since gone to God, but her name was Sister Marie William. She was our prioress general, so our mother superior, during the Second Vatican Council. And during that time, there was lots of confusion in the church. And Sister Marie William, Mother Marie William at the time, was a great woman of prayer. And so during this time, when there were lots of different opinions and different ideas being thrown around, she took every decision to the Lord before she decided anything. And she really included every sister in her prayer. And her great gift to us was that after the council, she discerned that it was the Lord's will through the help of St. Catherine of Siena that our order keep our religious habit because there were some that were deciding not to have it anymore. So we just, they decided to keep it. And it's been such a gift and also to be someone who's entered in the last 10 years. This was a long time ago, right? This was the 1960s. So this, she was making these decisions for all of us long before I, we were even here. And we're so grateful for her now that we have, we have our habit and we have our community life that we love so much. And our sisters always wear the habit whether we're teaching pre-K or we're teaching at the university level, and we, we just love it. Our sisters continue to study after we enter and really for our entire religious life because we know that the more we know about God the more we can love him the more we know about his children the more we can love them so we continue to study so I don't even know what grade I'm in I'm in like the 20th grade <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that we study in our country we study in Rome we have some sisters that have been studying in Australia as well and it's just a great grace of the Dominican order that we recognize this importance of study, that it leads us closer to the truth. And we know that the truth is Jesus Christ. So the more we know, the more we can love. And sisters enter with all sorts of varying education levels. Some enter right out of high school um, and some enter after college. So we're really blessed as a community to be able to provide 
for those who have entered right after high school provide for a college education um, or to provide a teaching license. Some of us did not enter with a teaching license, so um, we're able to study with our sisters. We have a college here in town, Aquinas College, that we can get our degree from. Or there are sisters who do enter with a teaching license, and that's wonderful. The community can use that, but uh, we all study philosophy and theology because, like sister said, the more we know, the more we can love, and it leads us to truth himself, so it feeds that contemplation so that, again, we can receive and to share that what we have received. Okay, thank awesome. you so much thank for being with so us. Much, sisters, okay, so Dawn is going to um, do the Q&A with you. Uh, so get ready. You're teenagers, <laughs> so this should be easy peasy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna play a little devil's advocate here. Um, why choose your order when there are so many sisters who teach? Like what? I think so many women want to know how do I really find out what order I'm made for and is there is God really calling me to a specific order and how would I even find that order when there's like 20 million orders that teach? It's a really good yeah. question <laughs> and the answer is the Lord will lead you to the order he wants you to be in. Uh, this is huge for me because uh, I, in my discernment process, I just was attracted to the church. I love being Catholic. <laughs> so like every community is so beautiful and so necessary because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a need in the church. And so that community, that, that apostolate is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, and there's, like you said, there's tons of teaching communities, but that you find within your own self that, that the Lord has given you certain desires or gifts or even just inclinations that resonate with the charism of a community. We talk a lot about charisms of communities and, and it's a mutual discernment. It's a discernment on your own part. Um, you bring that to the Lord, but it's also a discernment of the community. And so they walk with you. Um, that's part of like getting to know the different communities or, or even having just coming to visit and they give you the one-on-ones. It's mutual discernment. Um, Yes, so like there's just things that resonate in your heart because I was attracted to a lot of different communities. Uh, but when you get to the right one, all of a sudden you just feel like you're at home. And, and, and you can't, there's no secret recipe. It's, it's totally the Holy Spirit that'll lead you to that. Um, but he plants those in your own heart from the very beginning. And so anyway, it's, it's, it's a joy. <laughs> but prayer. <laughs> yeah exactly i love it the experience of home you know it's sometimes when you can't doubt like no i remember this very deep home experience and relating to the sisters in a certain way um somebody was asking about conflicts in relationships like when you have so many sisters in one convent for instance <laughs> you know clearly there's probably a lot of different personalities and what happens when conflicts arise? What do you do? Is there counseling involved sometimes? How does that all go? So everyone that's here, we're really trying to be saints. The goal is heaven, right? And if we're really trying, like you're really trying to be saints, we help each other, right? So you've got to, we've got to grow in virtue. We've got to have extra compassion, extra charity, extra mercy. patience, mercy, and grace, the grace of God. One sister, her mom says that the greatest proof for God is that this many women can live together. <laughs> and, and, you know, we love it. <laughs> so, but this, it is a real striving after the love of Christ for your sisters and for yourself. There's tons of questions regarding getting to university and all that kind of stuff. Um, once you're in the order, your order funds your university work, right? I mean, you, you get paid as a teacher, and it goes towards education, right? I mean, tell us a little bit more about how all the funding goes. So when, when you enter, when we make profession, we make vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So it is a real religious family. We, we, we give our whole life to Christ and the church through the order, and they take care of everything for us.
And how long has your order been in existence? Since 1860. Beautiful. We have a poll, poll questions for everybody while we do these final few questions. So I'm going to launch the. Go for it. Go for it, Rhonda. Um, as she's launching the poll that the, the ladies will take, Thank I do you. want to ask. Um, Question regarding, and there's a lot of questions regarding like dating and how do you, how do you make sure you're not, for instance, let's say you're having conflicts getting into an order. Are you, is there a sense in which you're running away from vocation? How do you distinguish, do I have a religious call? Am I running away from vocation? Am I running away from marriage? If you could speak on like dating and marriage as a vocation too for a second, that would be great. Yeah. Is beautiful and a great gift and natural. We all want to be mothers and wives. The religious vocation is just specific that we become the spouse of Christ and we have spiritual children all over the all over <laughs> that we love everyone as our spiritual child or at least we strive to um and so they are the call is similar so there's not and i think people out there are just sometimes just looking for the right answer and i would just say start looking for the heart of christ and he will lead you peacefully to your vocation and he is he's enough and he doesn't tease us he doesn't want to confuse us so follow his peace and his voice but the first thing before you even start don't worry about that just follow christ <laughs> and he will lead you when can you describe is that your order is contemplative active right was that what you consider your order some yes. of the women might not know exactly what contemplative is if you could just briefly mention that and what should a woman do to prepare like to know if they could have a call to such a prayer life how do they start praying well the best way to learn how to pray is to pray you know <laughs> so i mean it's practice kind of like what sister said earlier about silence uh, um realizing that the lord speaks to us in silence and so that's the first prayer you know sitting in that silence with the lord sitting with scripture um just pursuing the Lord because he's pursuing each and every one of us because um, he just wants to lavish his love upon us all. Um, so there's really having a life of prayer. So taking time in the day to be silent, to have uh, read the scriptures, to read or just a spiritual book. I mean, there's loads of beautiful books out there. Um, there's a great one about the, the new line of Dominican spirituality that talks a little bit more about um, what does it mean to be a Dominican or and you are Christ by Father um, Thomas Jube. That's about what does it mean to be a, a consecrated religious and, and discerning the call to take a vow of power to pass in obedience. So those are beautiful books, but scripture first and foremost, because that's how the Lord speaks to our hearts, but you can always be nourished by these other spiritual reading books as well. Also, don't be afraid to go and receive as much of the sacraments as possible. You know, go to your priest, go to confess, frequent confession, um, daily mass if you can, or if you can't go to daily mass, at least to stop in and do your own chapel visit, mm -hmm. um, Eucharistic adoration. Um, yeah, so be involved with your, your parish life because uh, our faith is so vibrant and so rich. And um, yes, the Lord is just helping us. So just receive those graces, and take advantage of it. Yeah, and everything she just said, no matter what your vocation is, yeah. you want to be doing those yeah. things. So you want to take time to pray every day, regardless of what your vocation is, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not sure where to start, dear Jesus, help me to pray. I'm not sure what to do. That is a beautiful, honest first prayer. But the spiritual reading, the sacraments, everything, that will enrich, enrich your life um, as a Christian, and we'll help you for whichever vocation the Lord has for you. Thank you so much, sisters. You have been amazing. Everybody, round of applause. Yes. <laughs> awesome. 
Thank you so much. much for coming. Many, I know so many people have a favorite part of all of what you've just shown us. Mine for sure was that chapel and the singing and uh, <laughs> the heritage room, just so special. So thank you for taking so much time to be creative and wonderful with this. It's been such a blessing to all of us. Oh, it's our privilege, and we'll be praying for all of you. Thank you. All right. God God bless you. Bye. Bye. Okay, everybody. We're finding now the Daughters of St. Paul.